Genesis chapter number three, verse number six, it says that when the woman, Eve, saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Here we have the account of the first people to have an identity, to forfeit that identity, and to try to cover themselves with a new identity. Adam and Eve, the very first humans, made from the the heart of God, out of the dust of the earth, then Eve from the rib of Adam, given identity as the first son and the first daughter of God, placed in a perfect environment. No sin, nothing had uh, corrupted the environment into which they were born. God gave them one rule to obey. He said, that tree there, leave it alone. And Adam and Eve had the rest of the created order, all for their pleasure, all for their delight. They walked in fellowship with God. They enjoyed his presence. They had conversations with him. Something to, uh, in in the natural, literally, the spiritual and the natural were uh, unmitigated. They were together in absolute perfect oneness. And then came the serpent. Then came the devil. And then came the enemy. And he sought to do to them what he wants to do to every one of us. He wants to bring about a loss of our identity. For Adam and Eve, we're going to see the loss of identity that was due to their shame. And so let me just give you a couple of things. I'm just going to work my way through these. I'm not really teaching verse by verse this morning. I'm going to exhort you, and I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit will move in the midst. And don't worry about the distractions. Just focus right up here, and let's see what the Holy Spirit says. First of all, When Adam and Eve fell, it was because the serpent moved in among them, tempted Eve in particular to doubt God, to doubt the goodness of God, to doubt the nature of God, to doubt the will of God, and Eve began to do so. And so she succumbed to the serpent. We had an interesting day yesterday. I was down here doing some marriage counseling, and I get a frantic phone call from my wife. She says, I'm trying to keep my heart from beating out of my chest. There is a four-foot black snake moving across our kitchen floor. Yeah, that was too good of a story not to, I was going to get that in a sermon one way or another today. And as I opened up my Bible just to prepare a little bit this morning, I realized, you know, there's always just something about a serpent that brings some discord into a, a situation. For Adam and Eve, it was much more, much more worse than a, a frightening moment. It was actually the introduction to sin into the cosmos. And so as Eve ate the fruit, she gave to her husband Adam to eat. Immediately, an awareness came upon them. They had acted independently of God. Let's just use the right word. They had sinned against God. They had violated his his holy word. They had distrusted his love and his best plan for them. They listened to the temptation that maybe they were missing out on something good by trusting and obeying God. So they began to distrust and disobey God. And then in the end, sin entered in and they suddenly became aware of something that had been the reality the whole time. What was it? They were naked. So they were living in holy innocence with no shame, no embarrassment, nothing. But when sin came in, they suddenly became uh, intensely self-aware. They looked at each other. They realized they were naked. They knew God would be doing his morning walk soon. So they did what a lot of people do. In response to the shame that came from their sin... They had lost their unique identity, and what did they do? They do what all of us do. They tried to find some way to cover up their shame. And so for them, it was gigantic fig leaves that were in the garden to to cover their, their nudity. 
and, and they're hiding from God. So get this, shame caused them to try to cover up their, their fallenness and shame caused them to hide from God. And immediately for the first time in their relationship with the Lord, they are no longer operating in sonship, they are operating in shame. And their identity was gone. And so what's beautiful about this is Adam and Eve, listen, although they pretended not to be fallen, although they were hiding their nakedness and their shame behind these insufficient fig leaves, God still came after them. Not to destroy them, not to, not to uh, throttle them, but to come and seek their restoration. What, what, what does this have to do with any of us? Well, I'm just going to be raw and honest with you. If you're new to your Bible or you're not yet a Christian, and maybe you're not familiar with Christian doctrines, let me tell you what the Bible says about all of us, every single person, that we are sinners by nature. That means we are born with a nature that is bent towards sin, and we are sinners by choice, which simply means this. Apart from the grace of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, that we will choose a sinful path of conduct every time. Apart from God, we will choose a sinful path of conduct. So we're sinners by nature, we're sinners by choice. Now, the remedy for that is to acknowledge it, confess it, and to bring yourself in humility before God and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. My identity as a sinner needs to be not hidden, not covered, not compensated for, nor do I need to operate in shame. I need to bring it before you and acknowledge that a sinner needs a savior. But this is what so many things are offered to us in this way. People want to cover up their sin. They want to cover up their shame. They want to cover up their spiritual nakedness. Hebrews tells us that we are naked and open, standing before the one with whom we have to do. It means we can't hide anything, and yet we try to. Um, I believe that religion is probably the most rampant fig leaf that people try to hide behind all the time. I think sometimes it's success. Sometimes we try to overcompensate in one area in order to ignore the issue that we don't know who we are with God. We don't know what happened to our identity. And there's so many things in our, our lives, in our culture that says, here, make this your identity. Do you know why people hunger and thirst in life? Do you know why people long and want in life? Do you know why people are pressing, searching, and, and looking for something in life? It, it, apart from Jesus Christ, it's because everybody knows they don't know who they are, they don't know why they're here. And so it's this vacuum in the human soul that is crying out, and they don't know they're crying out for it, but what they're crying out for is, somebody tell me who I am and why I'm here. And so the world steps forward and says, try this fig leaf on for size. Wrap your life in this. Here's a little success. Here's a little pleasure. Here's a little uh, fame. Here, here's a little power. Here's a little education. Here's a little knowledge. Here's a little of this and a little of that. And so people wrap themselves in fig leaves and they feel secure for a little bit. But in those quieter moments, they're still saying, who am I and why am I here? I know I've got success, but who am I? I know I've got beauty, but why am I here? I know I've got money. I know I've got achievements. I know I've got education. But all of these fig leaves, all of these things I've made about my life, I still don't know who I am. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you this, because I don't want you to mistake this. Some of you may be new here, and you're thinking, this just sounds like you know, Tony Robbins' self-help talk. No, no, no. Let me tell you. You find out who you are when you begin to understand who he is. And you don't want to know he, who he is just to find out who you are. It's a byproduct. It's not the purpose. You want to know who he is because he's the only one who knows who you are. And in coming to him, you are blown away when you find out who he is. And quite frankly, it's in those moments where you're not as insecure about who you are. So it's, it's this issue. But Adam and Eve, they just pretended not to be fallen. I mean, if it had been left up to them, they would have stepped right out into the presence of God and, and basically looked at them and said, what fig leaves? What are you talking about? What fig leaves? I, there's no fig leaves here. What are you? And, and God goes and he, he's calling for them and they're hiding. He's like, Adam, where are you? Not because God couldn't find them, but because the very thing that God wanted to do to begin the process 
in restoring them, he's, he's like, Adam, I want you to acknowledge where you are with me. I want you to declare, well, I know where you are, son. I know where you are, daughter. You don't know where you are, so let's start where your honesty needs to come forth. And Adam gets honest for a minute. He says, yeah, I, I heard you calling, and I, I, was, I was scared of you. And I was afraid, and I was naked, so I, I tried to make some fig leaf underwear, and it just, you know. And, and ultimately, after Adam and Eve worked through the blame game, blaming each other, blaming the devil, the Lord looked at them, and at one point, he required them to take off their fig leaves. I'll tell you why I know that. It's not actually written in the Bible but he made them take off what they were trying to cover themselves with, their false identity, their hiddenness, their shame, those things they were that covered up the broken, fallen, sinful parts. And God said, I need you to take those off. And there they had to stand before him naked again for a moment. But what God had done that they didn't know is God had slain one of the animals. He had slain a sacrifice on their behalf and he took the skins off those animals and he provided the covering. He did all of the work. He shed the blood. He provided the covering. He wrapped them up in it and there they could be restored back to him. What does that have to do with anything? Friends, that's a picture of the atonement. That's a picture of what Jesus has done for us. We're told that apart from the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness of sin. Our coverings don't cover. They deceive us into false identity. But when God shed the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, he robed us in effect with the righteousness of Jesus. And he says, there, now your shame is canceled. Now your guilt is gone. Now you and I can resume our walking together again. And Adam and Eve couldn't take any credit for it because what they had fabricated was unprofitable. Those leaves just weren't going to do it. But when God covered them in the sacrifice he appointed, they were now welcome to resume that relationship. You see, God provided Adam and Eve, first of all, a summons. Where are you? Acknowledge where you are. And then he provided the sacrifice. And that's what he does for all of us. When it comes time for us to really, really want to know who we are in Jesus, in some unique way, God will summon us to a place of acknowledgement. Lord, this is who I am. I, I want to pretend to be something more or something different or something else, but Lord, you know this is who I am. I answer your summons, and then God meets you in that place of honesty with him and humility with him and submission to him. He says, now that you have acknowledged where you are, I'm going to meet you there with the sacrifice and the covering I've provided. I wrap you up. Don't operate in shame anymore. I, I'm going to give some of you permission. I don't know if it will, if it will activate this morning, um, but you need to hear it. There is no such thing from God's perspective as shame on you, my child. God doesn't speak that over his children. Uh, Amy and I don't speak that over our kids because we recognize it is a kingdom, it's an illegal comment in the kingdom. Because when we're in Jesus, there's no such thing as shame on you. There can be sin that's pointed out, but God does not legislate shame. Some of us can't come into our identity because the enemy is hissing as he serpentines through the garden of our life, and he's hissing out, shame, 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 shame. Create a fig leaf. Wear a fig leaf. God doesn't provide everything you need, and he leaves us in this place, and we've got to come to this place at some point where he decide, are we going to listen to the enemy try to reintroduce shame that Jesus died to take off of us? Are we going to listen to God who says, you may have done wrong, but I don't shame you. I've provided for that. Now go and sin no more. So some of you are free and you don't know it. And the reason why you don't know it is because you don't feel it yet. So you're waiting to believe it until after you feel it. And I'm going to suggest if you'll start believing it, then you'll feel it. And so we've got to get to that point where we migrate out of the curse of the garden and the fig leaves of shame. Let me give you another one. There's another loss of identity, and this is big in our culture. I could have given you a list of 100, I promise you, but I'm only going to give you four, and here's the second one. A loss of identity due to greed. Who am I talking about? 
This is who I preached a full message on in the earlier service today. I'm going to talk to you for a moment about Jacob. Let me read some verses to you out of Genesis 27. I don't know if these will be up on the screen, but if they're not, just listen. Uh, it says that Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, who is her older son, which were with her in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So we went into his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you've told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly? He's talking about the, the venison. How is it fo you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. That's the religious thing to say. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to, his, to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is like Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's hands. So Isaac blessed Jacob. He said, are you really my son Esau? And Jacob said, I am. Now, that's in the middle of a much longer narrative, but let me tell you what's going on here. Jacob and Esau are twins. Esau was born first. Jacob was born second. The firstborn is entitled to the blessing of the father, which includes a lot of material wealth and a lot of spiritual, uh, I would say, advancement opportunity in the patriarchal line. And so Jacob has wrestled with Esau since they were in the womb together. The Bible says that when they were in the womb together that, that Rebekah felt in her belly a war going on between these two. When the twins were actually born, Esau comes out first, and the Bible says that Jacob was literally holding on to his heel when he came out second. He was holding on to Esau's heel. Jacob is pictured as the guy who always wanted to be first. He always wanted to be top dog, and he's proving it in his relationship now as an adult with his brother Esau and with his father Isaac. And so what has happened here is Esau has been told by his dad Isaac, who is blind, Go out and kill game, wild game. Let's just make it deer stew. Go out and kill a deer. Make me some of that deer stew that I love. And after I eat what you make, I'm going to give you the blessing of the firstborn. So that would have been fine, except Rebecca heard it. Rebecca's the mom and the wife. Rebecca's little baby boy is Jacob. Esau is the favorite of his daddy. Rebecca loves Jacob. And so you've got a wholly dysfunctional family here. There, you think dysfunctional families started like in 1965? No, they've been around since the, the patriarchs. So they're playing favorite with their kids, and Rebecca says, hey, look, I don't want your older brother to get the blessing. I want you to get the blessing because you stay home with mama all the time, and I love you. And so she sends Jacob on the mission to deceive her husband, his dad. And so Jacob goes and kills a goat, puts on the hairy skins of the goat because apparently Esau's hairy and Jacob's smooth and so Jacob goes in with a meal that his mama made and he goes in pretending to be Esau with the with the dinner that his dad requested so immediately what do you have you have a false identity assumed by Jacob you got Jacob just like Adam and Eve wrapped themselves in fig leaves Jacob's wrapping himself in goat hair in order to prove to his father that he's somebody he's not and so what happens is he goes in, and a couple of times, Isaac's blind physically, but he's, he's saying, something ain't right here. So he keeps asking Jacob, Jacob, oh, he's saying, my son, which one are you? You sound like Jacob, but you smell and you feel like Esau, so que sera, sera, bring me dinner. And he eats the fake dinner that Rebekah made, and he blesses the son who had deceived him. Now let me tell you what happens after that, because there's a point to this. Immediately afterward, Esau comes home, and the whole thing falls apart. Jacob and Rebekah have deceived Isaac, but Isaac says to Esau, hey, I've already blessed him. I can't retract that blessing of the firstborn. It's on Jacob, and Esau is enraged, and he puts out a bounty on his brother. 
So Jacob literally has to flee town. He never sees his mother again. That's just a word to the wise, man. All of their deception that was supposed to be in a blessing actually ruined the whole family dynamic. And so Jacob goes, and let me tell you what God does with him. I'm going to condense this story a little bit. So Jacob has declared that he is Esau. He's adopted a false identity, all because he wanted the blessing, both spiritual and material, that belongs to the firstborn. A lot of property, a lot of wealth was associated associated with it. Jacob really liked that stuff. But now Jacob's on the run. He ends up in a, a land down the road, a, a fair piece, and he's, he, he gets hooked up with this man named Laban who eventually becomes his father-in-law. And Laban's a pretty shrewd businessman. If Jacob is a deceiver on a level three, Laban's a deceiver on a level 10. And what God does for the next 20 years is l- let Jacob live a life where every day the deceiver is being deceived. Every day. How many of you know God will bring people into your life to reflect to you how you are to God sometimes? Yeah, that's not a happy part of the message, but sometimes we need to hear the, the healthy part, even, even though it's not a happy part. So what, what does all this have to be? Well, listen, Jacob pretended to be Esau in order to secure a blessing for himself. And there's a whole lot of that going on. That we pretend to be something other than we are in order to gain stuff that maybe God never intended for us. I am not a hater. If you're blessed and wealthy and prosperous, hallelujah, especially if you're honoring God with it. But if you're compromising your identity in Jesus in order to serve what Jesus called mammon or unrighteous gain, then it's not a blessing at all. It's going to turn out to be a curse. Why? Because it's robbing you of your identity. And I'm going to tell you the God of this world, which is money, the God of our culture, which is money, um, it, it requires your wholehearted devotion and loyalty if you're going to serve it well. And for Jacob, he ends up going, getting tricked by his father-in-law, has to work 14 years to get the daughter of Laban that he really wanted. And then Laban tricks him in business. And the whole thing falls apart with Jacob taking his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 kids, and they're on the run. And as he's on the run, leaving Laban, trying to start off, he's still operating under a reality that was cultivated through a lie about who he was. He's never repented of it. So what does God do? God brings him to a wrestling match. Jacob gets alone with the Lord, and during the middle of the night, God comes in human form, wrestles with Jacob all night, pins him to the ground, and he only has one question for Jacob. Do you know what the question is? The question is, what is your name? What is your name? He's got Jacob all bent out of shape. Jacob won't let go. Jacob's still trying to win, even against God, and God's just saying to him, I want you to say who you really are. And he goes, my name is Jacob. And God says, it is good that you've said your name is Jacob, but from now on, I'm calling you Israel because you've wrestled with God and you've prevailed today. See, God's not like us. And I'm not being heretical here. I'm just being honest. If you or me were God and Jacob had been rebelling against our Godhood, when we wrestled him and pinned him and we said, what is your name? And he said, I'm Jacob. We would say, that's right, you're Jacob. You've been living like a fool. And we would have taken him and body slammed him again. That's not what the Lord did. The Bible says that the Lord, upon Jacob's confession of who he had been living as, Jacob, by the way, the name means deceiver. So Jacob, in essence, when he says his name, he's like, I'm living up to my name. I've been living a life of deceit. I've not been who I am. I'm I'm a thief. I'm a conniver. I'm a blessing stealer. I'm Jacob. I'm the deceiver. And immediately, it's just amazing to me, as God had touched Jacob during the wrestling match, he threw his hip out of joint. And for the rest of Jacob's life, God blessed him. God blessed him. We're not told what the blessing entailed. It probably had to do with the Abrahamic covenant. But he blessed him immediately after his confession. The Bible says Jacob got up the next morning, and I'm not not being disrespectful here. I'm just giving you an illustration of what it might have looked like. It says that Jacob moved like that the rest of his days. So God gave first Jacob a limp, and then he gave Jacob a legacy. 
because he changed his name to Israel. Some of you for the very first time are hearing where the name Israel came from. It came from that wrestling match from Jacob and God. When God pinned Jacob, Jacob acknowledged, Lord, you are who you say you are. I am who you say I am. And Lord, I am here before you. Every step Jacob took for the rest of his life, he was reminded, I need the Lord every day. I need the Lord every step. I cannot live under a false identity. The limp turned out to be not a curse, but a blessing because every step he took, he was reminded of the merciful God that met him in his deceit and brought him into his identity. Third one, King David, an amazing man, my favorite Old Testament character. David lost his identity due to self-will, and pride. It's self-will and pride. Let me see if I can just quickly, these won't be up on the screen, but I'm going to read just briefly from 2 Samuel chapter number 11 about this moment in David's life where things imploded. It just says, in the spring of the year, David's already the king, it says in the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained behind at Jerusalem. So David's not with the army where he's supposed to be. They're all fighting battles. David's taking a tour of his own palace. And then verse 2 says, It happened late one afternoon. David arose from his bed, was walking on the roof of his house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. Now, David hadn't sinned yet. David sinned because he didn't look away and he started thinking about what he was looking at. The temptation wasn't that he... He saw somebody bathing. The temptation was is that he lingered and he looked and he longed and he lusted. And then he used it as power, used his power. And verse 3 says, David sent and inquired about the woman. And one of his servants said, Isn't this Bathsheba the wife of Uriah the Hittite? His servant saying, No, 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 she's already taken. David didn't bat an eye. He sends a messenger takes her she couldn't say no by the way it's not her fault she could not say no to the king and she came to him and for the sake of young ears in the room you know what happened so from that lustful union in that moment where David should have been being a king David's a king David's a man after God's own heart David's the one that God raised up to turn a nation back to him God put down wicked and carnal and a sociopathic King Saul and raised up David and David had been faithful and David had honored the Lord. But when David started getting cushioned in life, where all the bills were paid and the palace was big and the territory was expanding and the army was undefeated world champions for the 10th year in a row, when everything was going David's way, he dropped his guard and forgot he was a king. And when he forgot he was a king, he became an adulterer. All in one day. So, a month later, word gets back to the king through a messenger. You know, remember Bathsheba for last month? She's pregnant, and it's yours. So David wouldn't acknowledge that he was an adulterer, because that's his moment to repent before the Lord right there, to acknowledge what he had done, to repent before the Lord, to acknowledge his sin, to confess, to get right with God, to remember I'm a king who sinned. I'm not an adulterer who has to go to the next step, but unfortunately that's what David did. Because he wouldn't acknowledge he was an adulterer, he became a murderer. You see, friends, when you go down the slippery slope of false identity, you get further and further away from whom God says you are. And when God confronts you, it's not to bust your groove or ruin your day. It's to bring you back to the place where his blessing is. It's to bring you back to who he says you are. It's, to, it's to, to provide you an opportunity to step into what Jesus has bought for you in a time where you've migrated away for it. But David wouldn't acknowledge it, and so David went further away. Most of you know the rest of the story, but eventually Nathan the prophet comes into David and gets David by way of, even though David was reluctant, David finally confesses what he had done. He killed Bathsheba's husband in order to cover up David's adultery. The baby that was, was conceived in that, basically it was rape. It was, it was government-sanctioned rape of Bathsheba. That's how far David had fallen from his identity. 
And that baby, of course, went home to be with, hev- uh, to be with the Lord in heaven. And David and Bathsheba, they, they, they received, first of all, David received grace. Now, you may not like this because there's something in our heart that says, he ought to pay for that. Be really careful because we aren't different than him. Say, so I've never committed adultery and I've never murdered. I'm going to tell you what the scriptures say. James said, if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. Aren't you glad you came today? Amen. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is bring us to this place to recognize we have to run back to grace. We have to long for grace. And when God offers grace, although we have to acknowledge what's behind the fig leaf, what's underneath the the goat hair, we have to acknowledge that. Of course we do. We have to be honest with God. He can't promote hypocrisy. God never advances the hypocritical heart. And so we, we have to come to this place where we say, Lord, my identity is that of a king but I've acted as an adulterer. And in my pride and self-will, I became a murderer. But Lord, you've confronted me. I acknowledge who I am. And God gave David grace. David's gonna have some problems for the rest of his life. But I wanna tell you, after the grace came glory. Flash forward a thousand years, Jesus is walking through the dusty towns and across the side of a road where he's walking, this piercing cry comes out. Jesus, son of God. David. David was so restored by grace and so granted glory from God in spite of who he was temporarily for a season that his his name became associated with a messianic title of Jesus. Why do I even bother saying that? Because again, the temptation is for us to refuse to acknowledge where we are. If we've fallen, how far we've fallen. And we just assume that we can get it all together, get it, we'll work it out. We don't have to acknowledge that. And instead of confessing and forsaking it, we just presume upon God's grace. Listen, we owe the Lord the honor of standing before him at times and saying, Father, I know you've made me a son, but I've acted like something different. God, I know you've made me a daughter, but I've acted outside of my identity. And Lord, I bring to this to you. I confess what I've been acting as, but I'm asking you restore my identity restore my identity give me back that which I thought was cheap and I was able to live without but Lord I'm coming back to you let your touch be on my life again and so David was one of those who he got into his self-will and pride can I just give a quick word here David wouldn't listen to anybody he didn't have to do what he did with Bathsheba God was sending people to David saying no 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 An impulsive moment of lust, O king, is one thing, but you are transgressing the law of God when you're calling her to come to your apartment. And David didn't listen to it. So because he wouldn't listen to the warning, he had to listen to the correction. The warning could have prevented it all. And I just feel this. I feel this like just a prophetic thread right now that the Lord is graciously warning some in the room. He's warning you, not because he's mean, not because he's a a tiger looking forward to pouncing on you. He's saying, don't do it anymore. Don't go there anymore. Stop now. I actually feel like it's in the realm of of this very thing that David was dealing with. It, It could be what started as an innocent flirtation with somebody that's either married or you're married or both. I I just, I, I sense like right now the grace of God saying, repent today heed the warning and you'll never have to deal with the correction it could be in that area or it could be in any other area a word to the wise is sufficient last one this is the one that i believe is probably most common with us as believers most believers don't plunge headlong into a david bathsheba situation most believers don't intentionally listen to the devil the serpent so they can disobey God Uh, most believers aren't willingly um, regularly deceiving and defrauding people out of their inheritance so it's real easy for us to say yeah those jokers needed grace Those, those guys those are some some guys that really were acting independently of their identity because their sins were so obvious it is possible that we could think none of this applies to us, but let's go to this last one. 
And it's the most familiar parable that Jesus ever gave. It's out of Luke chapter 15, and it's uh, commonly referred to as the prodigal son. But ultimately, I believe the parable, the central character is not the prodigal son. It is the amazing father. The father is the central figure in that parable. And if you're not familiar with it, I'll, I'll summarize it for you. So a father has two sons. And the one son is young and he's impetuous. And he's, only, he's just so wrapped up in himself. He's so full of himself. And his dad's pretty wealthy. And so this young guy gets tired of waiting on his dad to die so he can get the inheritance. So he commits one of the most egregious dishonors that could be done at that time. He goes to his dad while he's still living, and he says, can you go ahead and kind of give me what I'm going to get when you die? Can I have my inheritance? And the father actually gives it to him. So the Bible paints the picture of this young guy with possessions and money, but no wisdom and no Holy Spirit. And he goes and takes all of his father's inheritance that was afforded to him, and he goes off for a season, and he lives in a Gentile country. It would be like, I don't want to dishonor any city, but it would be like us moving to the most sinful place we can think of so we can enjoy our time there. We got an unlimited credit card. We've got all the liquor, all the women, if you're male, all of the pleasures of life, and, we, and all of a sudden, amazingly, we've got a bunch of new friends. Surprise, surprise. Open tab everywhere he goes, and eventually he squanders everything he has. And he's so filled with shame that he says, I can't go home. So he ends up being a pig farmer, but he's so hungry, he gets in the pig pen and eats the pig food with the pig. And the Bible says the young son comes to his senses one day and he says, you know what? I remember the heart of my father and I'll, I'll never be his son again. He's lost his identity. He forgot he was a son. He says, I'll go back and be one of the, the servants. So he makes the long trek back home and his father sees him coming. It's as if the father in the parable has been scanning the horizon, waiting for the day where the one he loves, his son, yes, his son's a rebellious, rebellious young man, but he's still his son. See, the boy forgot his identity, but the father didn't forget the son's identity. The father always remembered who the boy was, but the boy had forgotten who, the son of, who he was as a son to the father. So as the boy's coming over the hillside, it's the way I've already pictured, the old man did something that old men didn't do in that day. Old men, you didn't run back in the day. It was undignified. It was for children. And the old man, the Bible says, just, Jesus said that he just takes off running. He grabs his son. He's kissing him. He's rejoicing. My son has come home. My son has come home. My son has come home. He says to his servants, bring the best robe. Bring the family ring. Put some shoes on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. My lost son has come back home. And boom, it blows everybody's mind. By the way, that's the way God responds when prodigals come home. That's the way God responds, even when we don't know our identity, but we know he's better than we can imagine. Even if we're crawling on our belly because we're wrongly thinking, we're filled with shame, the father runs to us. You might forget who you are. He will never forget who you are as this kid. And so that's the awesome part of the story, but there's another part. Because this is, this is a loss of identity due to distance the boy was able to forget who he was when he was distant from the father but as soon as the distance was bridged he was reminded oh this is my dad and i am his son and i've been welcomed back home we call that grace but there's another son and although he never left the family farm he was as distant from the father as the rebel was you got a rebellious son and you got a religious son you got the older son, and he's watching. He hears all the music. He hears all the shouting. He hears all the celebration. He's like, we don't allow fun around here. There's no fun. We're here to work. We're doing a farm there. We don't celebrate. What's all this celebration? And the servant comes and says, you didn't hear? Your father's other son is back. Your brother has returned home. So one might think, if the older son is connected to the father's heart, 
he's going to celebrate like the father, right? He's distant. He's as distant as the rebel was. Let, let me just pause here for a minute. And especially if you've ever been wounded by the church. And listen, people say regularly, it's just common kind of fodder that, oh, there's too many hypocrites in the church. Okay, fine. Hypocrites are everywhere. You don't quit going to Publix because there's hypocrites there. <laughs> you don't quit shouting for your favorite team because there's a hypocrite at running back. There's hypocrites everywhere, but why is it because it's at the church that people think they got a free card to walk away? All right, that didn't cost you nothing extra. Now back to the message. He didn't know the father's heart because he's in the home. He's obeying all the rules. He tells his dad that, by the way. So his dad comes out, and the older brother's just sitting on the front porch. He's had a transfusion with a lemon. I mean, he's just... Some... And his dad says, son, come on in. Your brother's home. And he looks at his dad and he says, I've slaved for you. I've worked for you. I kept all your rules. I did everything I could while he was off in the far country wasting the inheritance on prostitutes and drunkenness. I'm not going in there to party. And in saying that to his father, he didn't just indict his brother. He's indicting his father. He's saying to his father, you've done something wrong by welcoming that rebel back home. And when I see this, I see these two extremes. Worship team, y'all can come on up. I see the extremes of distance in those who have forgotten they were a son or a daughter and they're living in the land of rebellion. And I'm just going to go ahead and not ask you. I'm going to tell you, if you're a Christian and you've spent some time distant from the Father in the land of rebellion, you are so unhappy. Right? Perfect. You couldn't have timed that any better. Did you hear that? It's awesome. Thank you, Lord. That scream, that cry of, ah, that's, that, that's, the, that's the far country. You're miserable. You're unhappy. You're not enjoying it. Why? Because you're trying to enjoy something while you're denying your identity as a son or daughter. And, and God sees to it that it's not, there's pleasure in sin for a season, and then you get sober. And, and then you get, you get kicked to the curb by the one that you've been living as a prodigal with. And you're doing all these, and, and, but listen, to the other extreme, the rule keeper, the obedience the one who looks the part and plays the part and knows all the rules and knows all the verses, knows when to show up, knows when to stand up, knows when to sit down, knows how to play the part, but doesn't love the Father and doesn't feel loved by the Father. All you got is religion. You're just as miserable as the person in the far country. So the Lord, pictured by the Father in this parable, the Lord is saying... I'm bridging the distance. He ran to the son who was coming back from the far country and he walked to the porch where the religious one wouldn't come inside to be with the father. They are both lost their identity. And it's just simply due to distance. Friends, this is what the Lord is saying. Many, maybe you're thinking, okay, now tell me what my identity is, preacher. I can't do that. It's not my job. I don't, I don't know what your identity is. I mean, I, I know it's under sonship or daughterhood. I, I got that. But th this is the whole point of the message. God holds your identity. Your identity is in him. Your identity is wrapped up in Jesus. And the Lord just says, don't go on a search for your identity. Look at me. Come to me. You come to me. That's actually what you need you need to come to me i'm coming to you when you say yes to me not only do you know, begin to know who you are you start really realizing who i am as your father and friends it is a simultaneous oneness that begins to unfold in our lives your identity is not in the money you make or you don't make i'm not even asking you to agree with it i'm just being bold this is a monologue right now i'm telling you it's not in the money you make or don't make. If your identity is wrapped up in your income, you're living at a distance from God. Ladies, this is so common in our generation. Your identity is not wrapped up in your size or the elasticity of your skin or your body type 
or, or your facial structure or your hair. It's not you. That's not you. Gentlemen, your, your identity is, is not in your power, your authority, your level of respect. It's not your identity. Your identity is one who stands before the Lord and just says, this is where I've been. This is who I've been. Lord, I may very well have forgotten or never known my identity, but I know one thing, Lord. I know you know me, and I know you called me to know you. Jesus said this, this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Identity and salvation come together. Identity unfolds with time. Salvation births identity. Identity is found in this. Salvation, that they might know you. Salvation is knowing God. It's knowing him. Not knowing about him, but meeting him, bowing before him, acknowledging him as Lord Supreme, and receiving lavish grace and mercy that meets you where you are. From that moment begins to flow identity. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet.